The so-called JTB analysis of knowledge might well be the most famous piece of conceptual analysis in all of 20th and 21st century philosophy. And like so much philosophy, it is especially famous because it is wrong. I mean, it's boring for something to be right, you know, I mean, you finish talking about it almost immediately. Whereas if something is wrong, ha, now everybody can try to form an opinion about why it's wrong and we can all try to come up with better versions, better ideas, better analyses, or we can try to argue that the whole project of trying to come up with a good analysis of knowledge is foolhardy or something like that. Well, that is actually more or less the story of analyses of knowledge in contemporary epistemology, right? There used to be something that was, mm, I don't know, people sort of accepted it and maybe they didn't think about it that much called the JTB analysis of knowledge until a guy came along called Edmund Gettier who showed that it was wrong and then it all exploded and people started, you know, developing new analyses of knowledge and debating this topic uh, for decades. And we are still, to a certain extent, um, having that debate. So let's look at what the JTB analysis of knowledge actually is. And in order to do that, I would like to start by reiterating what an analysis of knowledge is. So a conceptual analysis in this sense is a definition that takes the form of well, something is knowledge, if and only if, and then we have a series of conditions, each of which is necessary, right? You have to have that in order to be knowledge. And jointly, together, they are sufficient. If you have all of these things, then you're knowledge. Okay, so the JTB analysis of knowledge is going to be exactly shaped like that. It is an analysis that starts with S knows that P, where S is some person and P is some proposition. Now, that means that the justified true belief analysis, the JTB analysis of knowledge, is an analysis of a particular kind of knowledge, a kind of knowledge that we usually call propositional knowledge. It's knowledge about how things are. It's knowledge about what is the case. It is knowledge that takes the form of true statements. So a proposition here is a statement that can be true or false, right? And um, so what we are analyzing in analyzing knowledge with the justified true belief analysis is not the kind of knowledge that we talk about when we say that I know Mary, right? I know Mary, I'm acquainted with her, I've met her. That's not what we are analyzing. It's also not the kind of knowledge when I say, oh, I know how to operate that machine, or I know how to swim. I mean, something I can do. That's not what we're analyzing. We're analyzing knowledge that takes the form of statements that could be true. I mean, they better be true if they're real knowledge, or could be false, right? Um, and so the, the JTB analysis of knowledge starts with S knows that P, if and only if. And then it gives three conditions. Each of these conditions you need to have in order to be knowledge. And if you have all of them, then you're knowledge, or at least that's the idea. That's the claim of the analysis. So the three conditions are J, T and B, justified, true and belief. Let's start with the belief. S knows that P, if and only if, one, S believes that P. In order to know something, you've got to believe it. Second thing. P is true, right? The thing that is believed must be true. Third condition, S is justified in believing that P. Okay, S is justified in believing that P. So, altogether, S knows that P, if and only if, S believes that P, P is true, and S is justified in believing that P. Well, let's go through each of these three conditions in turn and see why you would believe that it's necessary. And a lot of philosophers, not all of them, but a lot of philosophers agree that, you know, these three things are necessary, or at least something very close to them is necessary. Uh, and then once we've walked through all three and seen why for each of them you might feel that it, it is necessary, uh, then we're going to ask the question whether together they are sufficient. 
And spoiler alert, they are not going to turn out to be sufficient, right? It's going to be possible for things to meet all these three criteria and still not be knowledge. And we're going to see some examples of that. Okay, let's start with belief. Right here, belief is not supposed to contrast with knowledge. You are not supposed to think, oh, oh, you only believe it, but you don't know it. Right? This is belief in a sort of neutral sense. To believe something is to accept that it's true. So the idea would be that in order to know something, you've got to believe it. Right? If somebody asks me, well, what is the most populous country in Africa? Well, I know that it's Nigeria. And part of me knowing it is believing it. Right? I accept it as true. If I didn't, if somebody came to me and said, what's the most populous country in Africa? And I said, well, it's Ethiopia. And they said, no, no, it's Nigeria. And I said, no, 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 it's Ethiopia. And then we look it up and it's Nigeria. And I say, yeah, I knew that. Well, that doesn't sound good. I mean, how could I know it if I didn't even believe it, if I thought something else? Right? That doesn't seem to work. <coughs> so first condition seems to be necessary. In order to know something, you've got to believe it. Second condition, in order to know something, it has got to be true. I can't know that Ethiopia is the most populous country in Africa because it isn't, right? If something isn't true, you can't know it. Now, there are cases where we use the verb know, or maybe especially the verb knew, like in the past tense, in order to talk about things that weren't true. So, you know, if my favorite team loses the football match, I might say, oh, I knew that they were going to win, and yet they lost. We do use the word no that way sometimes. Um, what philosophers are going to say is that, okay, that's, that's, you know, not like the most serious use of the word no. That's a kind of use of the word no that's uh, a little bit like metaphorical or maybe it's to to express a certain kind of emotion but it's not like a core usage of the word no and so here we see that a conceptual analysis doesn't maybe always fit how we use words um, we try to sort of bring together the most important uses of the words and it seems fairly okay to say that when we use no in a sort of really core sense we are talking about things that are true. And when somebody says, I knew they were going to win and then they lost, you know, you could reasonably reply to them. Yeah, OK, so you didn't know it, right? You just believed it, but you didn't know it. Um, and maybe they would have to say, yeah, OK, I, I didn't really know it. OK, so in order to know something, it's got to be true. You've got to believe it. Now, already in an earlier video, we talked about why true belief um, is maybe not the same thing as knowledge, because I can truly believe something without having any good reason for it, right? Maybe I believe that Nigeria is the most populous country in, uh, in Africa because I like Nigerian music, right? I've been listening to some Yemi Alade. Um, I love it, love the sounds, love the songs. Um, and I think, oh, wow, that's so good. It must be the most populous country where it comes from. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Right. But suppose that's how I reason and that's what I believe. And I'm right. Well, I mean, it's true what I believe. Do I know it? Most philosophers have said no. I mean, that's not knowledge. That's too weak. Right? I mean, just if you're if you're right by accident, if you didn't have good reasons to believe it, we don't want to call that knowledge. Right. Knowledge is something better, more exalted, more serious than that. You didn't know it. You were just lucky, Victor. OK. <coughs> so let's let's go along with that, right? Let's say, okay, now knowledge has to be a little bit more than just randomly true belief. Um, well, what's the extra thing? That's what justification is supposed to do. I've got to be justified in believing it. And maybe the easiest way to think about that is I've got to have some good reasons for believing it, right? Maybe I've looked it up in a credible source. Um, I probably haven't done like a head count of every country in Africa, but I've looked it up in a credible source. Okay, that's a good reason to believe it. So I'm justified. Fine, that's, that's nice. All right, so this seems relatively plausible, right? In order to know something, you've got to believe it, it's got to be true, and you've got to have good reasons for believing it. You can't just sort of randomly pull it out of your, well, wherever you pull random opinions out of. So far, so good. 
We've got an analysis and every part of it seems to be necessary. And now the important next question is, are these things together also sufficient, right? Is it the case that if you fit these three things, then it's knowledge. Now, the answer to that in the case of the justified true belief analysis of knowledge seems to be no. It seems to be no because you can come up with all kinds of examples where we have justified true belief, but we don't have knowledge. And these examples are usually called gettier cases. They're called gettier cases because the first two of them were thought up by Edmund Gettier in a very short and very famous paper. Um, I'm not going to use Gettier's original examples because they are actually not the easiest to understand. I'm just going to give you three other examples. Examples of cases where you have justified true belief, but we might not want to say that you have knowledge. Okay. The first two are widely discussed in the philosophical literature. The third one, I've made it up myself to show that, you know, get your cases, they can happen in everyday life pretty easily. First example, actually the first example can happen in everyday life kind of easily too. Here's my example. So suppose that I look at the clock and I see that it's two o'clock. And I believe now that it's two o'clock because I've seen it on the clock. Uh, and it is two o'clock, right? That would be a situation in which I have a justified true belief. I'm justified because I looked at the clock, I believe it, and it's true. So far, no problem, right? Because usually this would be knowledge. But now we can add something, something that takes away the status of knowledge, but keeps the status of, of justified true belief. And what we add is that this clock is actually not working its battery has run out, it's standing still at two o'clock. Like its battery running out happened exactly 12 hours ago at two o'clock in, uh, in the night. Um, and so when I happen to look at it at two o'clock in the afternoon, the clock happens to show the right time, right? So I look at the clock, I believe it, I'm justified in believing it. I mean, this is usually a pretty good clock, right? So I'm pretty blameless. I mean, people couldn't say to me, Oh, those are bad reasons. You are stupid to believe the clock because I don't know it, right? I don't know that it's that it's stopped. Um, and so I'm justified. I believe it. It's true. But is it knowledge? I mean, it would be very weird to say that you can gain knowledge of the time by looking at a clock that has stopped, right? And so most philosophers have wanted to say here that, yeah, okay, what you're doing is justified and you end up with a true belief, but it's not really knowledge. So, <coughs> That's an example where we have justified true belief, but it's not knowledge. So the conditions might be necessary, but they don't seem to be jointly sufficient. Here's another example widely discussed in the literature. Uh, it's the sheep in the field. Okay, so I'm driving past the field. I take a quick look. I think I see a sheep. I believe that there's a sheep in the field. I drive on. That's it. Um, Suppose that like my visual impression was very sheep-like and then it seems that what I did was right. You know, I'm justified in believing that there's a sheep there because I had this very sheep-like uh, um, um, impression, right? Very sheep-like visual uh, experience. And uh, there is actually a sheep there. So I'm, I'm right and I believe it. And so again, I seem to have a justified true belief. But actually what I saw was a carton cut out of a sheep, right? Some local artist loves making these fake sheep, putting them in the fields, uh, so unsuspecting tourists will believe that there are sheep there. Uh, but, I'm adding something more, behind this carton cut out, there was a real sheep, which was asleep, just lying there. I didn't see it, I saw the carton cut out, but the real sheep is there. So what happened is I saw the carton cut out, very briefly, looked like a sheep, Seems that I'm pretty justified in believing that there's a sheep there, so I believe it. And it's true, because there is a sheep there, but I didn't see it. Okay, again, it seems that we have justified true belief, uh, even though I don't have knowledge. I mean, surely I can't know that there's a sheep there by seeing a cardboard cutout. That's the idea. Um, the sheep example with this artist who loves putting fake sheep in, in fields, uh, well, for an example, in the Gethier literature, it's actually 
still kind of realistic, but it's not very realistic, right? So I'd like to end by giving a third example that's a bit more realistic. So suppose that this morning I put the milk back in the fridge. It wasn't empty. There was still half a carton left. And so I believe that there's milk in the fridge, right? I'm sitting upstairs in my study making a video. I believe that there's milk in the fridge. But suppose that my wife this morning suddenly had a real craving for milk and she drank the uh, everything that was left. Um, and then <coughs> she went to the shop and bought some new milk and put it in the fridge. And so there is milk in the fridge. And so I'm right. I mean, I'm justified because I put the milk in the fridge myself. I'm right. There is milk in the fridge. I believe it. Justified true belief. But given everything that happened, right, the milk was actually <coughs> empty at some point this morning. And if my wife hadn't gone to the shop just now to buy some new stuff, it wouldn't be in the fridge. Given all of that, it seems a little bit much to say that I know that there's milk in the fridge, right? I'm kind of lucky that my wife already went to the shop. <coughs> Something that I didn't know anything about. So again, it seems that we have a case, and this is a very, I would say, fairly common case, um, where things happen in our lives and situations are as we thought that they would be. <coughs> oh, sorry for that. Uh, for reasons that we, that we, that we didn't know about. Um, this is a kind of situation that, that isn't that rare, but it's a kind of situation where we have justified true belief and we don't have knowledge. Okay, what's the end result of all of this? Well, almost every philosopher who read about this and thought about this thought, well, then the justified true belief analysis of knowledge is wrong. And what we need is a better analysis of knowledge. Right now that we have these counterexamples, what we need is we need to fix our analysis in such a way that the counterexamples now fit, right? I need maybe to add something to justify true belief or change something about justify true belief such that the clock, the sheep, the carton of milk now fit, fit the analysis, right? That they are excluded by my analysis as they ought to be excluded, but as they are not excluded by the JTB analysis itself. Um, and so what happens after Gettier publishes, publishes his counterexamples is that there's an explosion of analyses of knowledge, right? I mean, everybody in epistemology is trying to give an analysis of knowledge. Um, and we're going to look at some of them in the next video. So I hope to see you there.